Yeah. Everyone have a good um, talk on the earlier session? Yeah. Well, it's nice to see you all here. I'm not going to reintroduce you to Peter because I've already read his extensive bio this morning. Um, please give a warm welcome to Professor Peter Sowat. Thank you. Thank you all for, for sort of coming. So what I apologize that I didn't have as good a title to my topic as everybody else, but so I'm going to talk about chronic myeloid leukemia and really what are the addresses for issues for you and for us in, in, in 2023. So just I, what I'm going to do is just give a little bit of background to bring us up to where we are now and then what I what I see as the as the current things we need to think about. So chronic myeloid leukemia, it's uh, it's what we call them. It's one of the myeloproliferative neoplasms. It's a it's a stem cell disorder. What that means is that the initiating event, you know, is in is in this hematopoietic uh, stem cell, but it results really in a proliferation through of the of the myeloid lineage with an increase in and the white blood cells, particularly the sort of the, the neutrophils. So, so that's the that's the base of the disorder. This is a um, tube of blood. This is actually taken from a patient of mine that presented with CML and had a white count of around four hundred uh, times ten to the nine per liter. So the normal your normal white count is between four and eleven. And uh, when you when you take a, a tube of blood and you let it sit, as the red cells fall to the bottom. The plasma or serum sits on top, and you end up with a little layer of of the buffy coat, which is the white cells. This bit here are all the white cells, so those are the leukemia cells, and that's literally how leukemia got its name. Leukemia means white blood. So if you go back and to look at the original reports from the eighteen hundreds, as they they saw patients that had they thought this was was pus in the blood, they thought patients had infection, but probably what they're looking at. As patients with uh, with chronic myeloid leukemia, so about half the patients we see have this diagnosis picked up. Incidentally, they go to their you know they have an insurance checkup and have some blood tests, or it's their yearly bloods, and there's a mildly elevated white blood cell count or a mildly elevated basophil count, and the the GP repeats that, and then we sort of suggest, mm, gosh, this looks like it could be some form of uh, blood disorder, myeloid proliferative neoplasm, so suggests some additional testing, and that that you know takes it forward to a diagnosis. Other patients present with symptoms and often related to enlargement of the spleen. So as the white blood cell goes up because of that proliferation, the spleen goes up. So the higher the white cell count, the higher the spleen. So you don't have pictures on you of outlining your spleen, but as the spleen enlarges, it can cause discomfort and the, the upper left side of the abdomen, it can reduce the appetite and you feel full early because the spleen's pushing uh, on the stomach. So the symptoms related to the big spleen or we may find the spleen examining a patient. There's a very high white blood cell count. So it's one of the disorders where we see the white cell count being uh, sort of elevated. And the key discovery was this Philadelphia chromosome. Yeah, next one. So we we take it for, for sort of, you know, as I was saying in my earlier sort of lecture, you know, we're now starting to unravel what, you know, what the spelling mistakes are in the leukemia cells or in the, the genetic apparatus that controls the cell. Back in, in 1960, when scientists in Philadelphia discovered this, they thought it was just an incidental finding. It was sort of considered to be a stamp collection. Uh, and people didn't realize until... We got into the nineteen sort of eighties, nineteen nineties. That this wasn't just an incidental finding. This was the key event, the key driver. So, the diagnosis made finding the Philadelphia chromosome, and this is it here. So, the Philadelphia chromosome. Here's all our chromosomes. Yeah. So we have uh, forty six uh, chromosomes in our, uh, and this they saw this abnormal, this small chromosome twenty two. And then as people got better at doing these chromosome studies, so this is all your genetic information, that it was a translocation between uh, 22 and 9. So here's the normal 22. And see that bit there that should be there, it's shot off to chromosome 9. And 
that little bit on there's the normal nine that bit is sitting down here on uh, on 22 and so it's called the philadelphia chromosome or the 922 and next week is world cml day and that's on the 22nd of september that's because in the us they they do it all wrong and they call it 922 you know they just need to get with us and we would call it 229 but that's uh, <laughs> That's how which world world CML day. What's twenty second is Friday, so in, in six days uh, time. So this is Blood Cancer Month, and then on Friday is World CML Day. Next one. So this just shows in uh, in schematic form what's sort of happening. So here's the normal nine and the normal sort of twenty two, and we've all got on our normal on our nine. We've got this gene here, the able gene. And it's what we call a it's a tyrosine kinase. Most cancers, most blood cancers are associated with tyrosine kinases. They tyrosine kinases are either receptors or signaling pathways in cells. They phosphorylate uh, tyrosine kinases and that activates downstream signaling pathways. This one, when it's sitting here, it's what we call a proto-oncogene. So it's like a pre- cancer causing gene that's not very strongly expressed and that's on chromosome 9 on chromosome 22 is this gene they call bcr breakpoint cluster region and the translocation takes this gene 9 and puts it on 22 right in the in the the, the bcr gene so they they then form this fusion gene so you've got what we call five prime. So the five prime is where genes is the beginning of the end of where the, we read down a gene and that's BCR. And then attached to that is, uh, is ABLE. The next slide. And that BCR ABLE makes uh, a fusion protein. And here it is shown here. Here's the BCR ABLE protein. So the gene is the coding apparatus. So that's the genetic apparatus. And you know, we've all got those in our cells. So BCR able, it uses ATP to phosphorylate these tyrosine residues. And then that activates a whole lot of different downstream uh, sort of pathways, switches them on. And so the pathways are pathways to make cells grow faster. It changes the way they adhere to... Uh, to other cells in the bone marrow, that's why they migrate out of the marrow and into the uh, you know to the spleen, and it also switches on uh, what we call cell death pathways. So, all of our you know in all our tissues, there's this balance between growth of cells and dying of cells. We're in a balance. So most of the leukemias are changes that make the cells grow faster, so you get more of them. But but also if you stop them normally, sort of dying off, because that's why. All our tissues, you know, they go through a normal sort of, you know, they're a nice balance. So if you block the, the cell death pathways, they call that apoptosis, that also results in proliferation. And that that drives, and that's what causes the condition of, uh, of chronic myeloid leukemia. And so it moved from just being this incidental finding of the Philadelphia chromosome to suddenly you know, in the 1980s and 1990s, the science communities have said, gosh, this is this is the driver for, you know, for, for CML. And in fact, if you take this gene and you put it into mice, like in those mouse models, and we've we've done that, you you cause a CML-like condition. So you can use it to to study it. And if you put it into cells that you're growing in the laboratory, they grow just by themselves. They don't need growth factors to help them grow. The next slide. So then, and next one, um, the next one is that the the group uh, the community is saying, okay, well, if this is just in the you know in the leukemia cells, let can we develop a small molecule that inhibits you know the BCR able protein, and this is the drug called imatinib. Its trade name was Gleevec, and the Americans who again just as they switched around 9 and 22, 
we spell Gleevec G-L-I-V-E-C. The Americans put two E's in it because they couldn't pronounce Gleevec with an I. So they, they said G-L-E-E-V-E-C. So this is Gleevec. It binds into this ATP binding pocket. So ATP is an important source of, of, of power in our cells. So it binds into that pocket. So it stops the phosphorylation of the tyrosine switches off the activation of those uh, sort of cell path, these downstream pathways, and the cells sort of die off. So that was, you know, this was the first targeted drug. And this is why, you know, this is, it's such an amazing, so this was the first, the first discovery of a targeted uh, sort of therapy. The next slide. So, Gleevec or Matinib went into clinical trials. The first patients in New Zealand uh, we treated in September 2021 on uh, Imatinib, and uh, she went off of the trial. And it was incredibly brave of those patients because we didn't know the drug was going to work. We had we had the early data, but she went on to the that, and we didn't. Everyone thought, oh, it'll work for a wee while, and then it'll it'll stop working. She's now she's actually come off her amat in the banners uh you know it's not in any treatment she just has regular sort of monitoring and i kind of come to come to that the original studies the study that she went on to patients were randomized between a matinib and the best current care which was interferon and a chemotherapy drug and after 12 months the trial was stopped because there were such huge differences between the two arms it was considered unethical to continue the conventional care. So all but 13 patients out of around 11 or 1,200 swapped over to uh, Matinib. So we don't have any long-term data now, 20 years later, of comparing a Matinib to what was the best available care. And whereas most things that we put into clinical trials, you've got, you compare your new treatment with your old treatment and you've got follow-up at three and five years, but this was just such a phenomenal difference that uh, that that it was unethical to do this. So you didn't need to be a biostatistician to say these would were, were different. So the data we have comes from groups that have so like study groups and registries where they've treated patients on different therapies. So this is from the German CML study group, and this. This this is, looks at different treatment regimens over time. So this is in 1990s, 1980s, where we treated patients with chemotherapy, bisulfan or hydroxyurea, is that so these are survival curves. So remember I mentioned those. This is what we have to use in as clinical scientists and clinicians when we're looking at data. So these this is a Kaplan Meyer curve that predicts the probability of uh, of survival. So two decades ago, if, in the absence of the small number of patients who we transplanted with the chemotherapy, patients lived around four to five years. Because you can see, if you take about half the patients had died at around the four to five years, and that's because they'd progressed to an acute leukemia, which was very difficult to uh, to treat. Here we've got addition of interferon. This has got transplant. Imatinib went into clinical trial in the early 2000s. In New Zealand, it was uh, funded by Pharmac in 2003. So this is their imatinib data uh, for starting at 2002. So this is with the introduction of these drugs. And you can see the huge, and, and you don't see anything in medicine that that's, that that's different. Like, if you, no, no, I was just going to put my coffee down. <laughs> but you're not allowed to touch it. <laughs> you, you know, what you see is small differences. This is, uh, and, you know, I, I was, I have to say that I was, was doing trials at this time uh, is that I've never seen anything and I don't think I'll ever see anything sort of like this. It's, um, and, and uh, it's become, this is our model. This is how we want to treat other, you know, other cancers as, as well. Next slide. The other data we get is from uh, registries, and there's two, particularly Scandinavian countries, collect an awful lot of information, not just their incidents, but they 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 collect outcome sort of data as as well. So this is from the Swedish registry, 
the pub, uh, five or six or six or seven years ago, the Dutch, the Netherlands pr- published almost identical data uh, two years ago. So what they've done here, and they presented it for a whole lot of different ages. So I've just picked out the age 55, but the data, the curves look almost the same if you're 65 or 75 or, or 85. So what they did is that if you look here, back in, uh, you know, so 1970s, 1980s, so this is pre Amatima, pre any of the TKIs, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, is that if you were diagnosed with CML, your survival was somewhere around four to five years. Whereas if you were 55, whereas if you were 55, then, you know, you would be predicted to have another, you know, 25 years of life. So there was basically, you know, 21 years lost of life. And Matt and Nib came into clinical practice here. So when their data for 2010, or 2013, sorry, is that it's almost identical to someone of the same age diagnosed with CML. You know, so, so what this tells us is that in 2023, the patient who's diagnosed with CML in chronic phase is that we would expect you know, a life expectancy to be sort of very similar to someone of, of the same age you know, who doesn't have uh, sort of CML. Uh, and it holds up holds up for men and, and women, yeah. So you go then, okay, so the treatment of, of, of CML, so this is, this is a, a ribbon, this is a protein structure of uh, BCR able, and this is just showing the, I'm trying focusing on it here, but imatinib binding in here to that ATP uh, sort of binding pocket. So now for a CML patient diagnosed with, uh, in 2023, treatment with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor is uh, a standard of care. And move now the, uh, into pediatric, the data from children as, uh, as well. In the New Zealand setting, we've got, well, internationally, there are now, there's the first generation uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, in the trade name Gleevec, it's now come off patent. So when we first started, when we first and LBC did this uh, campaign to get it funded because it cost uh, $50,000 a year for the for the treatment. And that's that actually compared to other cancer drugs that we were talking about, some of the myeloma is actually quite, quite cheap. Some of the some of the newer antibodies um, you know, that we use in myeloma, you know, can be a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars a year. But at that time, uh, it was, you know, that was hugely sort of expensive. LBC ran a, uh, it was around an election time, they ran a campaign and it was uh, one morning, there was a whole lot of next to those, like the, the party billboards, there were suddenly pictures of CML patients uh, going up there. They lasted about 24 hours and then it's, people pulled them down again. But we campaigned. I remember going down to and met with the medical director for Pharmac and so said, I don't know why you've come. You know, this is not going to get funded. We presented the data and I could see, you know, they, you know, we got it, we got it funded. Uh, so that was in, in about 2003. There's now what we call second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So nilotinib and dasatinib are registered and funded in New Zealand. There's also one called basutinib, which is registered. When I say registered, that means MedSafe. MedSafe is the equivalent of our FDA. So they register a drug. So they look at, uh, is the drug safe? What's the data? Pharmac are the body that fund, fund the drug. So there's those two separate. Which in the US, the FDA is the equivalent of MedSafe. It registers the, the drug. And then it's the insurance company or your insurance company decides whether you'll fund that, fund it or not. So these uh, nilotinib and desatinib are, are are um, registered and funded. Basutinib is registered, but there's no funding for it. And now there's a third generation drug called panatinib, uh, which is again registered, uh, but is not uh, not funded. Uh, Dasatinib used to be available for first line treatment. So by first line, that's the first the first treatment that you have when you're diagnosed. Pharmac reviewed that. 
uh, uh, five or six years ago and changed it so it was only funded for for what are called high risk patients. So based on a clinical prognostic score. So if you put into the uh, your spleen size, basophil count, platelet count, uh, that gives a, a score. So it was only a small number of patients, and they also funded it for patients who went on to our the the KISS trial uh, as well. So this just shows the uh, the drug. So there, there's differences. So here's a, a matinib binds here. Nilotinib is very similar in structure to uh, um, to to a matinib, but it binds more tightly and it's more potent. It's around a uh, hundredfold more potent. And dasatinib is quite different in its uh, sort of structure and it's it's more potent uh, again. Next one. So you, know, you think, well, gosh, you've got all this sort of data and you've got similar survival, what, what questions are left? What, what, new, what is the, what's new? What's important for a, for a sort of patient? And, you know, I think there's still a number of, uh, of critical questions that, that, that we as clinicians, and I think for you, you know, are, are important for, for sort of patients. And, you know, the, the questions, and I, I'm going to go through these a little bit, but What's what's the best initial treatment if you were diagnosed? What would be you know what what tyrosine kinase inhibitor should you have? I want to touch a little bit on monitoring because again, this has formed the model of how you you know in the modern era how you monitor uh, sort of patients, and then the concept of you know can patients be cured? You know so the concept of treatment free uh, sort of remission so. Those are the three topics that I that I want to talk about, but I'm happy uh, to answer questions on anything anything else as well. So, when you know, when I when we see a new patient, you know, the uh, you know we know I'm showing you that data that we would expect you know the appropriate treatment, normal life expectancy. You know, if you were diagnosed at 40 or 50, then you're going to have another 40 or 50 years of life. So quality of life is, uh, is important. Avoidance of, of toxicity and side effects from treatment is, um, is important. Uh, and, you know, again, not for every patient, you know, is that, but, you know, you know there's, there's issues around if you're continually taking, you know, your treatment. So, you know, are the strategies, are the ways of avoiding, you know, long-term, uh, the need for long-term treatment. So if we're going for, you know, if, if our goal is that, you know, normal life expectancy, we need to get patients into a good molecular sort of remission. So we have to have a, you know, uh, you know it's fine. We want to minimize and manage side effects, but you don't want to compromise therapy. You still want to get, you know, the, you know, the maximum sort of benefit. And so, that's achieving uh, a molecular remission, what we call, I've used the term here, deep molecular remission. It, it a little bit depends on what you're aiming for. As, as, and I'll define these terms a little bit more, where, but certainly we want a good molecular remission. We want quality of life. Uh, we want to minimize side effects, and we want to avoid potential long-term toxicity and complications of, uh, of sort of therapy. And then for some patients, you know, do you want to come off uh, sort of treatment, the concept of treatment-free remission? So, you know, what is the optimal sort of therapy in 2023? So uh, in New Zealand, we're a little, we don't have, uh, we don't have the same choices. So you know, if someone's got standard or uh, risk CML, is that imatinib is, is the drug that's funded. And that's because imatinib has... Um, it's come off patent, and so used to cost fifty thousand dollars. It now costs around uh, one or two thousand dollars a year. So, there's you you may have noticed that for any of you who are on a mat and the the tablets, they, they sometimes the supplier changes, um, and it's it's a bit interesting. In the US, there's still the Novartis, which is there that that the the original product. It was still around. It's still around eighty or ninety thousand US sort of dollars a year. Even the generics are similar sort of cost, but you can go over the the border into Canada, and uh, 
you know, they've got their similar health, they've got similar funding of their health service to ours. So they're at similar, similar cost. Um, Desatinib is about to come off patent. So when that happens, the generic desatinibs will become available. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, one, although, you know, at times as clinicians and scientists, we're critical of, of Pharmac, one of the things they are very good at is, uh, you know, when when drugs become generic, of uh, they do a, you know their tendering process and are doing a you know a good deal, and so we have a lot of you know, for our pharmaceutical budget, we actually you know have access to a lot of a lot of medications, you know, not not in the high end of our area in the blood cancer, but if you look at you know the statins we're on for our cholesterol, our blood pressure lowering drugs, all of those is that that they are able to negotiate. You know they're good at that uh, of, of negotiating good prices and controlling our pharmaceutical budget. So, but if we went to Australia and I had a group of hematologists and said, "What what would you use first? It would probably split fifty percent between a second generation drug and fifty percent with uh, with a matinib. So, what why is that? So, oh, I've forgotten. I had the so this is. You know, it's still, you know, there's debate in the literature. So this is, I know this is four years, five years ago, but this was Blood Advances as one of our mainstream hematology journals. And these were just two different opinions. So uh, 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 George Cortez is from the MD Anderson. So MD Anderson is a huge cancer center in the US. They're very aggressive. Um, you know, their, their goal is, is cure cancer. And so, there, you know, uh, um, I've heard, you know, I remember their, their slides, they'd have, why would you drive a Toyota Corolla when you can have a BMW? Well, Toyota Corollas are quite good. Uh, the, 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 um, but, and then Richard Larson, they're, they're Chicago, and he's a very wise sort of clinician. And so, you know, it just shows that even in the hematology community, there's differences of, uh, of opinion. So the issues is that the second generation drugs uh, are more potent than uh, than than imatinib. And what we mean by that is that they get patients into a molecular remission faster and they get a deeper remission. So there have been a number of trials uh, comparing uh, desatinib or nilotinib versus imatinib. This is an industry trial. It was run by uh, BMS but they have been investigated driven trials and the data looks very similar. What they've looked at here is this is, they randomized newly diagnosed patients with CML and this is the percentage of patients that achieved a major molecular emission. Now I know I haven't talked about molecular monitoring as yet, but you know, our goal is to reduce down that the Philadelphia chromosome or the, the, the fusion gene, the BCR. So you know, a lot of you in treatment, you'll be having your PCR sort of measured. So a major molecular emission is a three log reduction in the level of transcript, the level of uh, the gene from baseline. So it's a level of less than 0.1%. The blue line is uh, desatinib and the yellow line is imatinib. So you can see that at 12 months, nearly half the patients have got you know, major molecular emission versus about 30%. And it continues in the in the the delta you you don't you don't catch up. You know, so so you get into a remission, you get a deeper remission uh quicker uh, uh, and it's it's deeper. And that um there's no difference in in survival. Uh, so these are the, the survival curves and that's because you know, if you can always change sort of treatments, but then the trials weren't designed to show that difference. They didn't have enough patients in there. So statistically, you know, you were never going to, because the, the endpoint was the molecular remission. So next one. So why would you not then, given that data, why would you get, why wouldn't you want to have, have uh, drive the BMW uh, if it was funded by government? Um, and the reason is that, Although we, these are smart drugs and we we see them as targeting BCR able, 
they're not, they don't just act on the one tyrosine kinase. No matter how carefully you design a drug, it also hits other things as well. It, it's certainly much better than the old style chemotherapy that 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 hit any any cell that was dividing, you know, be it you know your normal bone marrow cells or your cancer cells or your hair cells. These are very targeted, but they do hit other other tyrosine kinases, and there's some side effects from that. So what we see with nilotinib, and just the next slide, the next clip. So patients that are on nilotinib have got increased vascular toxicity. So it's probably a damage to the lining of the blood vessel. So we saw more heart attacks, uh, more strokes, more um, vascular disease on patients with uh, nilotinib. And oh, if you go back, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> You're trying to hurry me out. <laughs> I was on a roll, yes. <laughs> so, do you want me to go faster? <laughs> you can tell me. I can take it. <laughs> so, so the amount in the you know the vascular events one or two percent. So that's what you're going to see in someone because this is a condition that's affecting people in their fifties and sixties. So those of us that are getting that age, we have those we have vascular side effects. The nilotinib was sixteen percent. Uh, the satinib probably similar to the. So you know we'd want to be careful with this drug in someone who's had heart disease, had a heart attack, or has got a strong family history of vascular disease, or have got hyperlipidemia. So, you know, that, then you, and then to satinib, what we saw is we see pleural effusions. So pleural effusions is fluid that accumulates in the space, this pleural, pleural space where you get pleurisy, that space between the lung and then the rib cage. You the pleur, so you get a pleural effusion. So look, this, up, you know, 20 or 30% of patients on the satinib get a pleural effusion. Some of them are very small and you can manage it, you can reduce the dose, so you can stop it and restart again. So, you know, but but it can be, and if you've had if you've had uh, previous pleural effusions or heart failure with the tendency to accumulate fluid, that risk increases. And then the other complication we've seen is uh, pulmonary hypertension. So traditional hypertension, you know, systemic hypertension, you know, it's when your blood pressure is measured is high. Pulmonary hypertension is in the, the right side of the heart. So in the right ventricle, which pumps, so the blood comes back into the right atrium, then to the right ventricle is pumped up into the lungs. You get increased pressure there, which you can only pick up on a, an ultrasound scan of the heart. But between, uh, you know, one to five percent, probably not quite, that's quite high from the study, but can get pulmonary hypertension. So again, if someone already was known to have pulmonary hypertension, you wouldn't want to use this drug, or if you were concerned, uh, you'd use that. This is just showing the cardiac events in imatinib and nilotinib. So this is this is over the chance of the happening time. Green's the imatinib. Blue is the low dose of nilotinib. So when we first started doing the trials with nilotinib, we used a higher dose of 400 milligrams twice daily. Is the red, the, the 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 vascular side effects seem to be dose related. So we try and use as lower doses um, as possible. So this just summarizes, you know, when you're making a choice, you're thinking about, okay, what are my goals of therapy? What do I want to do with this patient? You know, is this someone young who I want to, you know, may want to stop treatment, but then balancing it against the side effects and just, you know, someone who's got cardiovascular risk factors, nilotinib. The drug panatinib, which is a third generation uh, sort of drug, the trial of imatinib versus uh, panatinib for the EPIC study, it actually got closed early because there was increased vascular toxicity, about 20% in the panatinib arm. So the study was uh, prematurely closed. Um, Basutinib, a lot of GI, gastrointestinal toxicity, uh, and then the pulmonary disease, the satin. The... Next slide. So we've uh, I showed this slide um, um, in my talk earlier, but one of one of the questions we asked was, could we um, was was through this the KISS trial, which we did 
and um, and still ongoing. So this is a phase two trial. So it's just a single arm. So the goal was use the desatinib early on. So hit hard with the desatinib, get a good deep molecular remission, and then transition to a matinib because we know. We've got we've now got twenty year data with imatinib. We know there's there's not late or unexpected uh, sort of toxicity. So this trial recruited newly diagnosed CML patients. They had they got desatinib, and then after twelve months they were in a major molecular remission. They had an option to transition to um, uh, to uh, to imatinib. I don't have a readout yet for the study. It's finished uh, recruiting. So we recruited just under 100 patients and uh, all patients have now reached their 12-month uh, sort of follow-up and have transitioned, if they were in that major molecular remission, have transitioned to imatinib. The biostatistician, I don't know if any of you know statisticians, but they just won't let you look at the data early. And I sort of said, Surely we can have a look at it now, but they they play it exactly by the rules, and so we've got to sort of we're not allowed to we're not allowed to. Look at, that's M. Morrison's wife. <laughs> so, as of you know today, what what would we do? So, uh, imatinib we're funded for first line, to satinib for, for second line. Um, I think the the choice of initial therapy. What are your goals of, you know, what do you want to do? And a lot, so you, you're going to look at the age of the patient. Uh, are they, you know, may they still, you know, so it's a woman you know, or a young woman, you know, she's still going to have uh, family, but someone in their 40s and 50s, they're going to want to, you know, are the options for taking, you know, consequence of taking tablets uh, for the rest of your life. If you're in your 70s and 80s, you know, it's, Maybe it's a bit like taking your tablets for blood pressure. So there's all of those sort of discussions and taking into account, you know, do you have other medical illnesses that might influence uh, that decision? The the UK guidelines still recommend uh, imatinib. So it's not a wrong thing. You know, it's, it's consistent with international thinking. The, the European guidelines that came out 2020, they're they're sort of agnostic on it. They discuss the benefits of different approaches, but they don't, you know, so they, it's really a clinician patient uh, sort of choice. So I hope you don't think I'm being like a politician of sitting on the fence with that, but I think it is still, I, I think it, it's, you know, there's a lot of issues to take into uh, to account there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The second topic I wish to discuss. <laughs> you, you need to new start. <laughs> was was the monitoring? So this is this is critical. Next slide. So <laughs> so when I, when I was a registrar, is that you know we would see patients and the things that that we would discuss and the patients want to know how big was their spleen, what was their white cell count, and we wanted you know we wanted to. We'd run the white cell count somewhere between 10 and 20. Remember, the normal range is 4 to 11. Then we'd try and keep the spleen sort of not, not being able to feel it or not that big. Whereas now, when patients come, you know, they're not, you know, they're not that interested in the white count or the spleen size. They want to know what's my PCR result, what's BCR able, and that, you know. And um, I know it's not a, it's not a, you know, from my perspective, it just shows how hematology leads we lead the world we lead in all the cancer area of this is you know this concept of molecular monitoring you know the minimal amounts of uh, sort of disease so what we're measuring is we measure you know bcr able because bcr able normal cells don't make it so we don't generally speaking you occasionally you see it in some normals but essentially it's just in the leukemia cells so we monitor it by what we call PCR, polymerase chain reaction. PCR is like a molecular photocopier. So what you do is you have your bit of gene and you, you have pieces of what are called DNA uh, primers that sit, one sits on BCR, one sits on ABLE, and then you add on a polymerase gene that synthesizes the, the DNA 
and you just you do multiple cycles and so you just amplify up so mo most of the testing we do in the lab we use pcr to make us more dna for the analysis this you'll hear sometimes the clinician may say transcript so of our of our genetic apparatus that's dna the genes dna is transcribed into rna and then the rna into the protein because bcr able is such a big gene we can't amplify the dna it's just too big you'd have your primers would be too far apart and you'd have to, for each patient i'd have to design a set of primers so we we analyze the rna uh, the rna just has the coding bits of the gene it's got rid of all the junk bits in between so it's much smaller so we have standard primers to BCR and uh, and ABLE. So when you have your blood sample drawn for molecular testing or in the bone marrow, we make RNA from that. RNA is quite unstable. That's why if you've ever had a sample that got accidentally collected on a Friday and then they come and sort of say, oh, it wasn't suitable for analysis. It's because it's not that stable after a few hours, particularly if it's sitting in the back of a courier's truck going around Christchurch or Auckland and it's got the sun on it, it, it degrades it. So, and some of the labs now they're quite good. They won't take the sample on a Friday. That's because the, the RNA will degrade and we won't get it. We won't get a reliable result. So we, we take the, we take the sample, we make RNA and then we, we convert it into cDNA. So that's like a DNA version, but it's just the coding regions. It doesn't have any of the junk there. And then we, we analyze that. Most of the labs in New Zealand in the last couple of years have gone to a, a machine called a gene expert, or a, which is, um, uh, it's a, these are bench top machines that initially the company developed them for virus, for, for COVID, and so that did all the COVID testing. They're, it's a wee bit black box technology. They're cartridges, you just put the sample straight in there does the analysis and we have a result within 48 to 72 hours. So usually your result by the time you do the quality on it, you know, you're getting a result back within a week. Whereas uh, the assay we set up in our lab was was quite labor intensive and would often be 10 to 14 days of, of having a result. So at diagnosis, we've got uh, very high levels of leukemia cells, estimated at 10 to the 10 to 12 leukemia cells. The there's a correction factor for the uh, for the BCR able the transcript number the PCR result 100 percent so all of us um, we shared samples with Seattle Hammersmith and Adelaide so it was to try and so if you were tested in Auckland or in Christchurch or in Adelaide your result would be similar in fact at diagnosis no one you know there's people range between 50 percent and and uh, 150 sort of uh, sort of percent, and so then we look for a reduction from uh, from baseline. So uh, one log reduction is 10 percent. Uh, two log reduction is one percent, and that that's sort of equivalent to clearing the Philadelphia chromosome. So if you went back, repeated the bone marrow and did the chromosome studies, that's what it would look like. And then a three log reduction, which is a critical time point, is less than 0.1. And we call that a major molecular remission. Uh, and then the machine, the, the, the benchtop machines record down to less than 0.003%. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a 4.5 log reduction from baseline. So four log or more is a deep molecular remission. This is a critical less than 0.1. So the lower the level, the lower the risk of uh, of of progression. Because the pre TKI days, the natural history was, you know, patients progressed into you know accelerator phase and and blast crisis, which was very difficult to treat. So when you're down at these levels, as that, you know, some of the studies say there's never any progression in biology. You can never say never, but you minimise the, the the sort of risk. The next slide. So this is, you know, this shows it in sort of a graphical form. So here, the diagnosis, and then we look, there's a couple of uh, important time points. The next slide. So at three months after we're on treatment, we want to see a one log reduction from baseline. So we want to see it 
less than 10%. And then at, uh, at 12 months, we're looking to see, next one, we want to see it a major molecular emission, less than 0.1%. About 50% of patients will be less than 0.1%. You know, but you just want to see it trending that way. Uh, you know, that that's our goal of uh, of therapy. There's, and so you'll hear your clinician will talk about have you achieved your molecular milestones? Uh, and so, you know, that three month period and uh, and twelve month period, and if if on repeating testing it's not getting there, then you know, you're going to consider do you you know uh, changing therapy to you know to a to an alternative uh, sort of tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So this has really become sort of critical and essential in our um, uh, you know for our monitoring. Next one. The the final topic that I wanted to just to raise with you that Tim's going to let me. Talk about was the concept of treatment treatment, which is probably the new, it's the thing that's moved from the research environment into, into a standard sort of clinical practice. Okay. So this is the question of, well, you know, they, and again, at, even two decades ago when we started, how you know, you're going, we never, we never conceived of this. We thought we were just, you know, the results were just, you know, getting patients into a molecular emission and being stable. You know, we, Took the approach. This is like treating diabetes or high blood pressure. Just keep keep the treatment sort of going. But then, you know, patients as well. You know, I what can we be cured? Can you come off the TKI? And so next slide. So why? So so sorry, I jumped ahead. So this concept of treatment free remission. It's it's a goal of therapy, and it's something we as the clinicians need to be talking to you. You know early on in the treatment. So, you know, it's it's a goal because it may influence your choice of treatment or what you're doing sort of early on. So why would you, why is it important? So it's, um, you know, the concept of, you know, if you're off, you know, if you're continually taking a treatment is that, you know, the concept of, a, of chronic disease and underlying sort of cancer, you know, whereas if you're off therapy, you know, as that you know, just that you know that relief of, of being able to come off your treatment. Um, we've mentioned the side effects, so long term, and you, know, you may be on these medications, you know, for twenty or thirty sort of years. So you know, potential there for avoiding those. Um, adherence to th to therapy, uh, you know, is that you know, there's no. Uh, if you have diabetes and you don't take your insulin, you know you have high blood sugar levels and have consequences of that. Whereas, if you miss your CML tablets, is that there's no change. You know it takes time for that. So, you know the there is an issue sort of there. Um, you know particularly in countries where you you know that aren't funded. You know like the US, there's the cost of the the medications, and um. The TKIs are potentially teratogenic. So, for uh, for men, the there doesn't appear to be a sort of an issue. So that's not such an issue of a partner becoming pregnant while on a TKI. But for for a young woman, as that you know the the birth defects have been seen in patients who are on on a uh, on a TKI. So if if we've got you know, a woman who because CML wishes to have sort of children, one of the things is we can achieve, you know, if we can get into a molecular emission, potentially come off TKI therapy uh, so that she can then conceive and be off the TKI, particularly in the, the early stages of the pregnancy. So there are now lots of uh, sort of studies. So this is the first study that was done. This is the French stopping a math in the bar sort of trials. So they took 100 patients. Uh, who had been on a matinib for over for five years or more, uh, and had been in a complete molecular emission for two years. So what this slide shows is this is patients who are remaining in a molecular emission, so without molecular relapse, and this is time from sort of stopping. So you can see that around forty percent of uh, patients came off their their matinib 
and remained in a complete molecular remission. You can see that there's patients, if they were going to have a molecular relapse, it occurred early. So the majority are in the first six to 12 months on sort of stopping. The next slide. And next one. And you know, if you're going to do this, the first thing, is it safe? Because if you're going to stop, stop a treatment, you know, what happens if it comes back? You know, you're going to go back onto treatment. You know, you want to, you want to know, be able to, re, you know, that it works again. And so all the relapses were sensitive to a rechallenge. So they all went quickly back into a molecular remission. So it's a safe thing to do, you know, if you, uh, you know, if, there's a, if there is a molecular sort of relapse. Next slide. Um, this was a bigger study, so this is the 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 European stopping kinase inhibition uh, sort of trial, uh, and it was slightly different. Is that here they called they allowed patients to become weakly PCR positive. So a fail was if the if there was loss of the major molecular emissions, so if the level went up to greater than 0.1 percent. Okay, and most of the trials now. Uh, a, a design like that. So it's not just loss of any molecular response. So patients can become weekly PCR positive and sometimes you'll see them fluctuate up and down. It's loss of the, you know, if it becomes greater than, uh, than 0.1. Um, and you go, that's right, you can do that. So you, you know, then, well, how can that be if you're still, because if it's still PCR positive, doesn't that mean there must still be a very low level of uh, the you know, a leukemia cell there? And that's true. And, and even in the patients that are completely negative, colleagues in, uh, in Adelaide divide, designed a really sensitive PCR test where they could detect down another log lower than, than the standard testing. And they found some of the patients that were negative, you could still, you know, there was faint levels there. What the current thinking is there's probably a, a quiescent CML stem cell sitting there. So most cancers are driven by by a small population of stem cells that where the initial change occurs. Those stem cells, they're BCRA able positive, but they're not BCRA able driven. So they're sitting there sort of quiescent. There may also be uh, some activity of the immune system. We talked the, this morning just over Sort of an immune response. So, is there is there an immune component to it as uh, as well? So, have we moved to this in the in New Zealand and Australian environment? And there's now, yeah, because I'm nearly out. Of, um, it it's now all the international guidelines have got treatment free remission as a as a goal of therapy. Um, you know, and we it's you know about fifty to sixty percent of patients. Uh, can stop their TKI and uh, remain in, in treatment-free remission. So the, the UK guidelines, ELN, NCCM, which is the US ones, uh, you know, they you know, see this as part of their treatment. Next one. So this is um, who, who would you consider for a trial of uh, treatment-free remission? You need to be on the, the, your TKI, your imatinib or your disatinib, for a length, so the longer you're on it, the better the chances of it of staying in a treatment-free remission. So at least five years, and being in a deep molecular remission for at least two years. So they remember the original STIM trial was complete remission for two years. Now we would take a, a four, like anything less than 0.01 percent for more than two years. If you're less than that, there's just too high. You know that it's going to uh, at, you know, high chance of it coming back again. So this is just now, this is our next one, I think the next one. Um, are there any risks with it? Um, so the um, most patients, uh, you know, if there's a relapse, it will, it will be in the first six to 12 months. So you've got to do intensive monitoring. We do monthly monitoring for the first six months and so monthly PCR. So if if I'm worried if someone is not going to be able to do that or they're traveling a lot, it's not a good time. You know, it's because you you want to pick up if it's going to progress. You want to you want to pick that up. Um, you, can you stop doing the monitoring? Do you get to a point 
where you've been negative for two years and uh, you know, do you have to do? No, I think you still you still got to come and see me at clinic. Uh, perhaps not as frequently, um, but you still need. We're still doing. I'm still doing three monthly sort of monitoring. I've had some late uh, late relapses. Can, can, no, it's going to go. Um, you can see, you know, although, you know, there's some blips here and that's where there's probably been one or two patients that have had a late relapse. So I continue the monitoring. There's a slide, I didn't put it up, but there's a study just published uh, looking at five years follow-up from stopping uh, to set in the... Thank you, thank you. What did you find? <laughs> It's worse when this happens when you're teaching students and they think, ah, oh, he is such an idiot. <laughs> um, they, they did the stop the set and had five years of uh, follow up. Their last relapse was at about 39 months. So we might get to a point where you can stop the monitoring. I, I because it's such an easy thing to do, I just continue with, uh, with, with the monitoring. Yeah. Um, so still monitoring, failure to get this. We haven't seen this. Patients have always, but it's, you know, have always gone back into a remission again. Next one. Um, there is a new syndrome that we've recognized called the withdrawal syndrome. And it's probably because you, you know, you're inhibiting a number of tyrosine kinases and then you lose that inhibition. And so those pathways become active again. So it's an arthralgia's arthritis. So, um, it's they say you know it's 10 to 20 percent of patients i i think it's a little higher than that they say it's relatively mild i've had a couple of patients who have had it quite quite severe and have said oh can i go back onto my tki generally it's it's higher if if you've already got a history of arthritis or fibromyalgia it's, it's worse so sometimes it's difficult to untangle uh, those most of them will settle down, self-limiting, you use a non-steroidal uh, sort of anti-inflammatory, but it is a new, that's really the only significant toxicity we've seen. Uh, so this is, these are the guidelines we developed in Auckland. So chronic phase uh, with with a measurable transcript. There's, what I mean by that, there's a few CML patients where you, there's not a, uh, they, have, they have variant transcripts, so we can't routinely measure it on any of our assays because you have to be able to monitor we would only consider it if it was a if you were on your first line, so you're on a matinib or whatever you'd been started on, or if you'd done the KISS trial to satinib and then onto a matinib. If you'd had resistance to say a matinib and then a change to to satinib, that we wouldn't consider it in that uh, sort of setting. So only a second line treatment was changed because of side effects. Good duration of therapy, deep molecular emission, so that's four log reduction for two years. Week monthly monitoring for six months and six weekly for the second six months and then continue on for three monthly. And we use loss of that MMR, so a level of 0.1, you're higher than 0.1%. So we will let patients become weekly PCR sort of positive. So that's that's our approach. And, you know, I think it's something, you know, not everybody wants to do it. So it's just something to raise and have that discussion early on. Next slide. Um, just, actually, I think I'll, actually I've run out of time. They, uh, so I'll just skip this slide and let's go to the, um, so just as of 2023, um, so the questions I see as important, uh, the initial therapy, you know, includes assessing what what the risk of the the CML is, uh, what our goals of therapy is. Is treatment free remission going to be important? And then other other illnesses that defines the treatment. Molecular monitoring. This is this is the most important part of uh, in achieving your milestones. And for some patients, you know, treatment free remission is a potential sort of goal. Next slide. 